Coming up in today's show, the Game Award nominations are out, and I've got a very fun panel of special guests. What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I'm Andrea Verne, joined by three wonderful people who we've been trying to get on the show for literally months at this point. Welcome, Alyssa, Mel, and Belinda. Hello. <laughs> Britt can't be on the show this week because she's got some family stuff to attend to, but I'm so glad that y'all are here. So we originally were talking about doing this panel uh, with you three ladies back in the spring of this year. And then, you know, life kind of went sideways for Brittany and I, and we kind of had to shelve this, but we're so glad that you're finally here. So to give everybody a, a proper introduction, um, please welcome Belinda Garcia, the Associate Narrative Designer at Sledgehammer Games. And we've also got Alyssa Harrison, the associate producer at That's No Moon. And last but not least, it is Mel Ramsden, the technical game designer at Flight School. So, ladies, is What's Good Games everything you hoped and wanted it to be? Are all the months of waiting worth it? And more. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> wow. This is breathtaking. <laughs> I paid them all to say that, everybody, in case you were wondering. <laughs> thank you for playing exactly. your parts exactly <laughs> as we discussed. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching What's Good Games, whether it's your first episode or your 250th episode. Magical 250 today, everybody. Uh, we're glad that you are here. I want to give a big thank you to our Patreon producers, Chewy's Godson, Alex Rogopoulos, David Icolucci, Ferris Atia, Justin Foshi, Matthew Godare, and Punctified. And welcome to our Patreon community, Charles Clift and Tobias. Mitchell. If you want to support our voices in video games, you can do so at patreon.com slash what's good games. And thank you to some of our new podcast reviewers, Z Mace, T Man 25, and Ert Ranger Truett, who merely said, Good job, podcast. Good job. Yay. You know what? We ask for your five-star reviews to help boost What's Good Games in the ratings, and you delivered. So thank you so much, Ert Ranger Truett, for those lovely words. Today's show is brought to you by Felix Gray, ExpressVPN, and Postmates, but I'll tell you more about that later. Ladies, this week we learned about the nominations for the Game Awards 2021. Now, we're not going to go through all of them because there's a lot, but I wanted to hear from the three of you kind of how you feel about the Game Awards and if you've ever been to the Game Awards. And of course, you know, we're going to dive into some of these nominees. So anybody been to the Game Awards? No. No, I have not. What? <laughs> Nobody? I know. No. <laughs> oh, no tragedy. Are you going this year? You know, it's in my plans to go. So our audience knows that What's Good Games is a voting member of the jury uh, for the Game Awards. And we have been for a few years now. And I've gone the last several years. So I'm hoping to make it. We even have a babysitter booked. So fingers crossed. It might be the first time that my husband and I are out together since before the baby was here, I think. Oh. <laughs> Which is kind of wild to think about. So I'm I'm excited about it. But I I love going every year because not only is it a wonderful time to catch up with people in the industry, but I think that Jeff Keighley, the executive producer, and his entire team do such a wonderful job of kind of like boosting the enthusiasm in the gaming community and kind of reminding people like why we get hyped and excited about announcements and about games and then of course you know recognizing some of the best of the best of the games that are nominated now i know sometimes the nominations can be contentious and there are definitely some snubs i remember when i saw uh, one of the producers at insomniac the year that spider-man was nominated against i think it was red dead redemption 2 <laughs> and i was like i'm sorry dude it just wasn't your year <laughs> just got unlucky just unlucky <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just it kind of happens that way but this year is a little interesting it doesn't feel like there's like a landslide winner this year um, I'm going to pull up the list of nominees uh, did anybody happen to see the nominations already yeah totally yeah um, mm -hmm. there are a lot of good stuff uh, this year um, I specifically really really loved Life is Strange True Colors and it's up for best narrative so that's kind of my choice because I 
totally, totally related to Alex's story and loved it and cried. Um, so that's 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 what's got my heart this year. That was a phenomenal game. I loved that game as well. Really, really good. I feel like Life is Strange <clears throat> as a franchise always gets a de facto nomination. It's like every year that there's a Life is Strange, every year it gets nominated because those two teams that work on that franchise always do such a great job. So just to recap, the Game of the Year nominees are Deathloop, It Takes Two, Metroid Dread, Psychonauts 2, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, and Resident Evil Village. I mean, wow, what a like weird slice of video games. <laughs> it's kind of Truly. all over the place too. Yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of different genres in, in game of the year this year. Yeah. hundred percent. And echoing what you were saying, like there isn't one on that list that feels like, Oh yeah, that's, that's a game of the year game. Like not that any of these don't deserve to be on that list. There isn't like that one, you know? Right. It's not like when Naughty Dog puts out a game, right? Or, you know, Rockstar puts out a game and you're like, well, that game is clearly going to pull a bunch of votes. I think this year, because as you mentioned, Belinda, the games are by genre are so different. I think it's yeah. going to be a lot of split vote with people not really knowing what's going to take it. It's almost like, do you guys remember the year? It wasn't even that long ago. It was like a Two years ago, 2019, when Untitled Goose Game won Game of the Year at the Dice Awards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was shook. I was there <laughs> that year because Br Brittany and I presented an award. And I remember sitting in the audience just like flabbergasted that, <laughs> that Untitled Goose Game won. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. You go ahead. I'm Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, I was just thinking about how like uh, the audience is so split for Game of the Year this year because we have like... Ratchet and Clank, I played and very much enjoyed. It's a it's a platforming game, like it's a it's an adventure game. It, it's very nostalgic for me. It's growing up in the PlayStation Two era, and then seeing it next to like uh, Psychonauts Two, it's kind of similar. And then there's It Takes Two, which is co op, and Resident Evil Vig Village, a horror game. Like <laughs> the votes are so spread out, <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't begin to like speculate of what what what's gonna kind of pull ahead. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and with that, like, I feel like all of these games have like very different audiences too. Yeah, one hundred percent. There's always going to be overlap, but like the people who really loved Ratchet and Clank aren't necessarily going to be the same people going to bat for Resident Evil. You exactly. Know? <laughs> Absolutely. I think the chatter that I saw online when the nominations were announced was a lot of people being upset that. Forza Horizon 5 wasn't featured and mm. as a judge I will say that we got the code for that game very late to put it in contention and it did technically make the cutoff as far as being eligible for nominations but I think we're just I would I'm guessing not just hypothesizing um that a lot of outlets because there's over a hundred outlets that vote and so you can learn all about all of those different outlets on the game awards website that they just probably didn't have enough time with the game to properly evaluate it which is tough you know like i think the first thing i thought when they pushed halo infinite's release date was oh dang it now it's not going to be in contention for the game awards and i know that jeff always comes out and is like well it's going to be eligible next year and i'm like yeah it's not the same though everybody forgets about it you know i'm like now what halo infinite is going to be pushed into contention against everything coming out in 2022 yeah. right like elden ring starfield elden ring. god of war ragnarok <laughs> horizon for ben west good luck halo good luck <laughs> potentially breath of the wild too <laughs> right <laughs> oh also, i mean that's how i feel about cyberpunk right it came out so yeah. long ago and when it came up in the nominations i was like oh yeah that was a game yeah. that came <laughs> i had exactly. the same feeling i was like oh right that was this year <laughs> Especially it's, since we're living in this like world of like time has no meaning for the last two years. Whatsoever. It's a flat circle. Like, yeah, exactly. They could have come out three years ago. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so of these narrative um, games, we have Deathloop, It Takes Two, Life is Strange, Guardians of the Galaxy, Surprise Nom, and then Psychonauts 2. Belinda already picked her favorite. Do uh, Mel and Alyssa, do you two have a favorite of those games? Oh, also Life is Strange. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, yeah. I actually, am, I, speaking out of turn, I haven't played the new one yet, but the original ones are so, so dear to me that I'm going to make a, a 
a wild swing that I'll probably feel very strongly about this one as well. You won't be disappointed. (laughs) (laughs) If you like Life is Strange as a franchise and have enjoyed your time with it, you will enjoy your time with True Colors, guaranteed. Um, So I... I think that it's always so interesting to kind of see what's nominated in in a bunch of different categories. Now, as developers, do you ever put like a lot of weight or importance behind these awards or are they just kind of like a cherry on the work that you've done? For me, it's kind of always been more of like a the cherry type feeling of like it's obviously something we always strive for in development. It's something that we talk about sometimes when we're like coming up with uh, features or like when we're imagining the final product or uh, designing like the experience, we're like, yeah, we want it to be something that's like this exciting. It's, you know, resembles something that we experienced for like, you know, game of the year, Breath of the Wild, like all these games that we think of that are just amazing quality and have like really incredible experiences and moments. We, We strive for that, or at least that's in the front of my mind often. But in terms of like actually taking home the award, like I realized that like, that's not necessarily the only signifier that like it wouldn't be healthy necessarily for me to attach my uh, my view of the quality of my work to one single award that is so broad and and has so many contenders in it that it's like I of course strive for it but it's not something that I'm like thinking of like I have to get this award or this is a goal of mine because it it can kind of get into the territory of like uh, <laughs> being being difficult to manage uh, like that versus just making sure I'm I'm focusing on on the work itself, uh, just kind of like making sure that I I stay focused on on my task and and what I actually want to achieve in terms of the experience of the game and less so the the award that comes with it. But it is always like such an exciting and fun prospect that that it might be you know something that I'm uh, part- participate in on something that I work on. <laughs> Yeah, I think any time you can get an accolade, right? It makes you feel good and lets you like pat yourself on the back. You're like, hey, all of those yeah. nights that I crunched on this thing, <laughs> they were worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More and- than anything, awards um, are a really great way to get your game sort of in front of people that may have missed that it came out. I think that's kind of the best thing about award shows and especially the game awards is it gets so many eyes on it. And I think Mm -hmm. that's really the reward because people will find your game that, you know, missed it during, you know, the year or were busy at the time and like, oh yeah, let's go back to that game. So I think that's that's what the game awards does a really great job of. That's such a great point. Uh Alyssa, you had a point you were gonna make. Yeah, um just kind of echoing what these two are saying, like it's definitely something that is a tr- very special feeling when something that you worked on is recognized in any way, shape, or form, be it something as big as the Game Awards or smaller awards that happen constantly. Um, but for me personally, like having that as being the the driving motivator doesn't feel the most like healthy and true to like making art um, as games are. Uh, it's it's more of a like for me making games is about finding the audience for a specific game and making sure those people enjoy what's been put out. Like you're making games for yourself, but you're also making games for specific people to love and enjoy. And if that isn't the same overlap with the kind of people who vote on game of the year or nominate, it's like, does that matter as much as like the people who you know will love this game, find the game and love it? Mm Mm-hmm. That's such a good point. I think sometimes we lose sight of that because there's such a giant sea of games to play that (laughs) it feels like you almost get analysis paralysis looking at it, but you forget that like, oh yeah, no, this game like speaks to a specific audience and it's okay if it's not something that speaks to everyone. But I think in that same vein, you know, it's great to see that more developers and more publishers are putting an emphasis on accessibility because sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle. Kind of like Alyssa's video feed. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> what is happening on that? Do I look good now? Am I here? Yes. yes. You are not a jumbly pixel Yay. stew. <laughs> The reason I bring accessibility up is because there's an Innovation in Accessibility Award, and this is a rather new award, and there's a specific set of jury members that vote on this. So this is actually, if you guys didn't weren't aware of the people who are listening and watching the show, this isn't open for every jury member to vote on. So what the Game Awards 
people do is that they want to make sure that the outlets who are specialized in esports, for example, or accessibility are the ones who are doing the nominating. So it feels like it's more targeted and the people who this is their specialty, that's all they do. Because it wouldn't really make sense for what's good games to be nominating like esports teams or players because we don't cover esports just like it wouldn't make sense for us to pick the innovation and accessibility because while we talk about accessibility on what's good games all the time it's not what we specialize in um but i wanted to mention it's far cry 6 forza horizon 5 marvel's guardians of the galaxy ratchet and clank rift apart and the veil shadow of the crown how have the three of you seen the conversation about accessibility in development, particularly in the studios that you've worked with, evolve over the last few years? Um, I can speak on, I, I worked at Ubisoft uh, previously, and I know that for uh, accessibility, like it's, it's something that is always a constant conversation with them, which is something that I really respect. Um, like throughout the the game dev cycle, um, they're always talking about it. It's always front of mind. Um, and I know Steve Saylor, who you know probably voted on innovation and accessibility, um, also works with Ubisoft really closely um, and does um, a lot of consulting on on their behalf and it's really great to see Far Cry 6 on there because they do go the extra mile and make sure that these are conversations that are not put in all the way like at the end and like you know shuffled in there um right before launch but it's it's something that is a conversation you know throughout the dev cycle in in my personal experience when when I was working there so I'm I'm really proud of UB and what they've done with accessibility. That's great to hear. It kind of feels like from what I've heard from devs, and obviously please let me know your opinions on it, that you can't really shove accessibility in at the end. It's pretty difficult, if not impossible, to do. Yep. No. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, it's something that I personally have always been really passionate about advocating for um, on any game that I touch and kind of trying to get on the ground floor and, and exactly that point. Like if you think about accessibility, like when the game is close to going gold, then your anything is going to be inefficient, essentially, or not cover the kind of ground that it should be covering. Um, I feel like the AAA space is getting particularly good at uh, marking progress in, in accessibility overall. Um, and India is starting to get there, which is very exciting to see. And it's exciting to see the different ways that these studios are approaching accessibility as well. Yeah, 100%. I personally tend to push the conversations in design meetings fairly early on, like during concept phase uh, and onward, that accessibility can be supported and should be integral to the design of your game. Like your mechanics shouldn't rely on one uh, like element alone to communicate to the player because you need more in order to make sure that your game is accessible and approachable by a wider audience and that people that have interest in your game actually can play it like no matter what like could be involved. Like making sure you have the accessibility features early on and make sure that your design is not dependent on that because that has been like the biggest thing of uh, like the, the getting tacked on at the end conversation tends to happen of like, Oh, well, we can't change it because it'll mess up the design or like, it'll make, it won't make sense anymore. And like that, that can't be how you continue to approach designing games. That's why like earlier better and like in the design room, in the design departments as well, like should be really part of the, the conversation. And that's, that's something I, I, I uh, bark about that all the time as well. <laughs> that's that's important, though, that to bark about it, right? I think that's how we got yeah. to where we are is because people started barking about it. People started yeah. saying, hey, <laughs> we want accessibilities in our games and we want it now. And I think there, as you mentioned, Steve Saylor is a great advocate. Our friends at Able Gamers are great advocates. I think there's more and more people who are doing things to say we want games to be av available for everybody. And I think that that's, that's wonderful. And, you know, Alyssa, I think you've been a good point about how it's just now starting to get into indie. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've heard Steve Spawn, the COO of Able Gamers, talk about, you know, kind of the pros and cons of accessibility in, in the indie space and how there's a lot of teams that just can't afford to build some of these tools into their games, but that the upside to working with indie is that they can be a little bit more nimble than working with a massive publisher like Ubisoft, for example, to say like, hey, you know, you know, have you thought about adding this specific feature? And, you know, depending on how big the team is and what their resources are, they may be able to pivot and do it 
more quickly than, you know, a 300 person team would be able to like run it through up the producer supply chain and get it signed off here and there. Um, I don't know much about org charts in, in dev teams, but I know just pretty a tiny much, bit. That was pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so that sounds extremely familiar. <laughs> yeah, <that's just> <laughs> Wonderful. I'm glad that I, I, I'm not talking out of my ass all the time, everybody. I prom <laughs> I promise you. Um, was there anything else about the nominees that you saw that stood out to you? Like a game that you were like, yay, I'm glad they got a, a nominee for that position. Yes, I was so, so I'm so glad to see Valheim on there for best multiplayer game. I I mean, this for personal reasons. This is not a subjective opinion at all. I or an objective, very subjective. I have had so much fun playing Valheim this year. Like I have like 200 hours of just me and my my best friends building a village in a giant tree, and it's just oh, and <laughs> amazing. As, it's it's so good, and like the the systems design like because my job like I invo I do a lot of what would be considered systems design I have a deep see like very deep appreciation for systems that lock in together really nicely and I find Valheim scratches that itch so well it's a very well balanced game and I'm such a sucker for like low poly graphics oh it's so cute I'm I'm so happy it's there <laughs> I completely the same I've been I've lost myself in Valheim on and off throughout the pandemic since it came out. It was a big <laughs> game for me and my coworkers playing together. Um, and like, it's the kind of game where you can play it in so many different ways. So a bunch of different kinds of game players can come together. Like yeah. there's, our, there's the builders on the team that are like, I'm going to go off and build like 12 houses and make them look crazy. And then the exploration people, Personally, I'm the one that is kind of like running in circles until someone needs me. And I'm fully satisfied doing that in that game. I was surprised by how massive the fan base for that game kind of grew overnight. Like it dominated Twitch for months, <laughs> it felt like. And I really wanted to get into it, but it kind of just kind of fell at the time of the year when I was a little laid up and couldn't play anything. Um, but it was really fun watching some people stream it and kind of see something that felt really kind of grassroots. And I think that's what's great about, you know, the online gaming community is that you can take something that could be, you know, a relatively small community and it can just magically become massive overnight. As devs, is that scary or exciting? Is it both? <laughs> Definitely both. Oh, absolutely both. <laughs> Have you ever had that like moment on a project that you've worked on where you were like, oh shit, there's literally like tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people playing my game, what am I going to do? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I think, like, the the day that Star Wars Squadrons launched, I was absolutely, like, awestruck at how many people were seeing something that I had personally worked on <laughs> and <laughs> spent many, many hours, like, tuning and designing and been in meetings for, like, you know, years to create this experience in, you know, a PvP sense and, like, seeing people engage with the mechanics that I was, like, I was there when they were designed. I helped design them. I helped implement them. I led some of those meetings, and now people are playing it and they're streaming it on Twitch, and I was, like... I have to lie down. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a cool was, thing, though. It was cool. Yeah. I was scared. <laughs> it was cool. I, I felt that way. I mean, Call of Duty Vanguard launched a couple of weeks ago, and that was my first AAA uh, <laughs> release. So that was really weird. <laughs> and just, just knowing how many people were playing it um, and definitely like going on Twitch and like clicking into everybody's <laughs> uh, streams and seeing it like how far they were in the campaign or if they jumped into multiplayer and just knowing like the little things that you contributed to every aspect of the game and everyone experiencing them was, was such a shock, but kind of really exciting. And especially when, I mean, Mel, you probably... <laughs> You probably feel this way because you're uh, in level design, but um, when people get what you were trying to do in the game, like you're just like, oh my god, you get it! I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yes, over it over and over again, and you're like, it's not gonna work. They're not gonna get it, or or it makes sense to me, and it makes sense to all the level designers. That is it gonna make sense? And then when it does, it's just like the most rewarding feeling. The most rewarding feeling. A hundred percent. I was I, like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like 
finding people playing your games on Twitch is like the most double-edged sword. Um, oh, yeah. It's super exciting. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, I'm actively watching someone engage in something that I, I helped get out into the world. But then it's like, oh, God, I know where all the like little bugs that we couldn't get to are. And the idea of like, <laughs> watching someone real time find those is the most terrifying. Oh, no. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. There's nothing more like disheartening as a designer to see somebody see like approach an area where you're just like okay and now this is gonna happen and then it doesn't happen because they didn't see it and you're just like i fucked up <laughs> and then like they find it 10 minutes later and they're just like oh i'm dumb and you're like no you're not dumb i'm dumb <laughs> see this is the pressure i feel whenever i go to a preview event and i've been to so many over the course of my career and then the devs just like stand behind you and watch you play the build and i'm like please like don't watch me fuck up your build. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't know what the controls are. And normally, like, the player at home has, you know, privacy to, like, learn the game usually. Um, whereas sometimes in these preview events, they'll drop you, like, 10, 20, 30 hours into the game. Ubisoft is famous for doing that. They're like, here, we're going to make you, like, level 50. Good luck. Um, and you don't get, like, any of the tutorials. You're like, cool, bro. Um I just always get nervous. And then the devs are like trying to like coach me. And I'm like, wait, I want to figure it out on my own though. <laughs> they never, they will never blame you. Devs will never blame you if you, you know, miss something or, or, or mess it up. They will always blame themselves. Like, oh yeah, we should have moved it this much. Yeah. The <laughs> like it would be little things, but they're just watching because they're criticizing their own work and not how you're playing it. That must be yeah. maddening though, because everybody <laughs> plays differently, right? Yes, <laughs> that's Beauty that's a hundred percent. Yeah, like being able to, and that's like a big part of. At least it takes up a lot of headspace for me working in design. Of like, okay, I want to consider like the core audience, like you know the folks that are like, okay, I'm I'm designing something that explorers are definitely going to find. I'm going to tuck this little treat away in this level, and I'm really certain that explorer type players are going to find it. But also, I want to make sure there are treats you know, rewards throughout the level that are not exclusively for, like, the folks that are going to go out of their way to go off the path and explore. So it's like, okay, I have to consider that people will engage with this art in many different ways. So I want to make sure that it's fun for as many people as possible and as many people as possible get fun surprises and rewards. Uh, but it's it's a lot to consider, right? And so when you're making a game in a specific genre, you kind of have to try to focus it a little bit, but still, like, consider as much as you possibly can within the constraints of the genre, which... Take I take I spend time doing. That. So you're saying game dev is easy? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's so, yeah, it's like no no trouble at all. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So easy. Um, well, I definitely want to continue this conversation, but I do want to just let people know if you want to watch the game awards, they are happening Thursday, December 9th. And they're streaming pretty much on every platform known to man. I saw Keely and his team were touting their impressive numbers. We talked about it on the show last week. Um, so I'm sure you can just pop onto Twitch or YouTube or maybe even TikTok this year. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> and watch the Game Awards. And with that, a quick message from our sponsors. This episode of What's Good Games is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like having a first aid kit, but not keeping it stocked up. Most of the time, you're probably going to be fine. But what if you suddenly get into a horrible accident and there's nothing in your first aid kit to help you stop the bleeding? Well, every time you connect to an unencrypted network, cafes, hotels, airports, any hacker on the same network can gain access to your personal data. Now, it doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack somebody these days. Just some cheap hardware is needed. A smart 12-year-old could do it for all we know. But you guys, your data is valuable. Hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling your info on the dark web. Now, listen, we've all gotten those emails. Somebody's stolen your username and your password and they're trying to hold you hostage or you're getting those annoying ads that are following you across every website because cookies are a thing you just can't surf the web without. So you know that there's a better way. And that better way is ExpressVPN. They've got an encrypted tunnel that creates a secure 
encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet where hackers can't steal your sensitive data. It's super secure. It would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past it. And you guys, it's super easy to use. All you do is fire up the app, click the one button to get protected, and it works on all of your devices, phones, tablets, laptops, and more. So you can stay secure on the go. Now, I love that when I use my ExpressVPN, I can hide specific search data for GIFs. This is especially important this time of year. If you share a whole household with friends or a partner or people that you're going to be gifting during the holiday season and you don't want them to know, ExpressVPN is going to be your friend. So while you're surfing for presents, all of your history is nice and private. Something to think about, everybody. You got to keep it on the DL. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash what's good games. That's E X P R E S S V P N.com slash what's good games. And you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash what's good games. This episode of What's Good Games is brought to you by Felix Grey. Felix Grey are the blue light glasses that started it all. Five years ago, Felix Grey realized that they wanted to create eyewear that would improve daily screen time. Now, since then, Felix Grey has been on a mission to create a better relationship with technology. Felix Grey lenses filter 15 times more of that important blue light that seems to permeate all aspects of our daily lives. Now, whether you're heading back to the office or maybe you're already in school or you're just planning a family get together, we're all going to be watching TikToks. You can count on Felix Gray. Visit felixgrayglasses.com slash games to check out their incredible selection. So you guys, if you're watching at youtube.com slash what's good games, uh, you can see I'm wearing my Roblings in clear. I've had these glasses for a while now and I love these glasses because what's great about the fact that these are blue light glasses and lenses is that they don't have that yellow tinge that some blue light lenses can get and they're super lightweight and they have all kinds of cute frames. Steimer used to talk about all the time how she loved her frames from Felix Grey. They also have non-prescription and prescription frames available depending on your vision needs. You can check them out now at felixgrayglasses.com slash games. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash games for free shipping, free returns, free exchanges, felixgrayclasses.com slash games so they know that What's Good Games sent you. This episode of What's Good Games is also brought to you by Postmates. Mm, you guys, I love me some takeout. So John and I just ordered from this amazing Chinese restaurant in our neighborhood. They have the most delicious pork buns and chow mein egg rolls, and sometimes if I'm feeling spicy, I'll get the Kung Pao chicken. Are you hungry yet? Are you thinking about Postmates yet? Because you can order from a Chinese restaurant in your neighborhood with Postmates. You can get all of your favorite foods from local restaurants in your neighborhood delivered without leaving your house. And even better, you don't have to get into your car, or find a parking spot, or talk to anybody. All you do is pull up the app and make it happen. Because Postmates isn't just all burritos and sushi. You can order things like toothpaste, phone chargers, and and more on demand as well because places like Walgreens and 7-Eleven are also on Postmates. So if you're like me and you have a baby and you're like, oh snap, we're out of formula and I don't want to run to the store, boom, Postmates. And the best part, you guys, is that the app lets you know when your food or your items have been delivered. Everything is right outside your door. You don't have to make contact with everyone. It's so cool. It never gets old. All you have to do is download the Postmates app on iOS or Android, find your favorite foods or stores and boom get it delivered on demand for a limited time postmates is giving what's good games listeners a little something new customers are going to get 50 percent off your first five orders of 50 dollars or more when you use code what's good that's code what's good to get 50 percent that's five zero percent off your first five orders of 50 dollars or more 
trust me, it's not hard to rack that up when you have a hankering for egg rolls. <gasps> Max savings of $100 per order. Just download the Postmates app or sign up online. It's super easy. Offer a subject to change. Taxes and fees apply. It's valid for 30 days after you add the promo code to your account. Welcome back, everybody. So we have been having a really fun conversation about video games and development and what it's like to work in video games. But the real reason we have these three wonderful people on the show is because you all worked on a game called Stonefly. So we mentioned this just briefly at the top of the show, but for people who don't know, I love this kind of tagline for the game. Rogue One shrunk down to fern gully size, written as a coming of age story. Do you still, is that the, still the tagline you stand by? Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. So could you, each of you tell me what you did on Stonefly specifically? I was a writer on Stonefly. Mel? Uh, I did uh, design, primarily level design, and I also did some uh, AI design and uh, ability design. <laughs> Excellent. And Alyssa? Um, I was an associate producer on the publishing side. Excellent. So it was interesting. I did get one question uh, from about this game specifically. We, most of the questions I got from our community were more general game dev questions, which we'll get to in a second. But Daniel Hall writes in and says, Hello, gang. I just bought Stonefly on PSN. Sorry it's on sale, so I was unable to get you the full cut. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, my question is, why the heck hadn't I heard of this game? Could you talk to us a little bit about the marketing in today's saturated indie market? I'm pretty up to date with video game graphic amusements and had not known the game existed. Have you guys heard this from other people that you know in the industry that it just kind of got lost in the sea of releases this year? I think um, a lot of that also had to do with events not being a thing, too. Oh, you know? yeah. Yes. I feel like normally we would definitely have boost at at PAX West or something like that and that's how I I get uh, information on a lot of the indies that I end up playing is like even Chicory that came out this year I played it at PAX West in 2019 oh my gosh that was forever ago but um, you know you miss the indie mega booth and you miss all of those things and I feel like Stonefly would have fit perfectly in that little nest um but unfortunately you know we haven't had events in a while so that could totally be part of it um but yeah i think well, that's definitely a big part of it for sure <laughs> well there you go daniel um so hopefully you will rectify it and, and play this game so let's talk a little bit about your guys's process in making this game so belinda as a writer um do you kind of start with one thing? Valerie Freeman actually has a great question for this. Does one person pick the idea for the game you're going to make? Or is it more like a group brainstorming session? Um, for me, actually, I got brought on. I was with Pop Agenda and I was doing PR for Creature in the Well, which is um, another game from Flight School. Um, and Adam and Bo kind of pitched me this idea. And it was very, very early on, but we knew that it wanted to have, you know, a, a young girl protagonist, and we knew that they wanted to be tiny. <laughs> and that was kind of really, you know, they were, uh, Adam did this beautiful, like, concept art where it's just like huge, huge, huge branches and leaves and then tiny, tiny people. Um, and so they asked me actually at PAX West if I would come on and help write the game. Um, and so I did that for, I want to say about a year. And early on, you do a lot of just throwing out ideas and it would just be me, Bo and Adam in a room, just throwing out ideas of, you know, what the world would be, uh, what the characters would look like. Uh, we didn't have any side characters yet. Uh, we just knew that there was going to be uh, a dad and, and a daughter. And so we kind of built it together and it's never just one person. Like it is never just a writer, never just an artist. Um, because once everybody starts piling in, you got level designers, you got animators, then they, you know, uh, they also factor into the story. And that's something I really love about games is that everybody's a storyteller, um, not just the writers or, or the artists. Everybody, you know, learn, everybody wants to make a great game and, and shares that same vision. So yeah, the story is always touched by every single person that touches the game. Even, you know, once it gets to marketing, then marketing, you know, takes that story and makes it their own and puts it out and publishing. So yeah, it's always, it's always a huge, huge, huge group effort. It takes a village. And this other video that I have has a familiar face in it. <laughs> 
That's me. That's you. <laughs> um, so, Mel, maybe you could take this question, or Alyssa, maybe you could take it too, or Belinda, if you have uh, thoughts as well. Sammy Nichols says, hello, what's your favorite part of the process of game development? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I It's hard for me to really pick one part of it. I I like different parts of it for different reasons. I really enjoy the early concept phase because it's, like you were saying, Belinda, it's just lots, just everybody throwing ideas out and you can come up with some of the, like the coolest stuff during that phase yep. because there's no limitations. There's no like, well, we can't do that or we don't nobody have the... no yet. <laughs> yeah, nobody said no yet. And it's, like, and it's like the sky's the limit. So it's it's a really ex- like exciting time. You can kind of push your push your limits a little bit as a as a creator. And then once you get into it, once you start building out the tools, getting into the more technical aspect of it. I love that stage because it's by far when I'm the most uncomfortable because it's so, so much more challenging for me because my technical skills are still growing. Right. So every, every project there's new challenges. So, and and I like learning new things because it's exciting and it's, and that feeling of like when you're trying to figure out how to get something to work and then you put it in the game and it finally works, you're like, I'm a genius. This is going to be great. And it's the most exciting part. And so like, that's, that's a really exciting and fun part for a totally different reason. And then like it coming out and people responding to it. I kind of went over that earlier of like the excitement and the tension and the anxiety, but it's all like, (laughs) it's a, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's all, it's a very, it's a journey (laughs) to kind of go through each stage. (laughs) Absolutely. I I have to agree that my favorite part is definitely those early stages. I'm incapable of turning producer brain off. Uh, (laughs) It's the early stages are fun because you're like making all these best laid plans and these beautiful schedules that nothing has been messed up with yet. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, ooh, like this is going to go perfectly, even though you know in the back of your head that it's like super not. (laughs) Like that, so that, that always feels really, really satisfying and, and accomplishing in that way. Um, But yeah, like the entire process of game development is so like weird and things are so fast moving and it's it's so much fun like solving like some of the silliest problems uh <laughs> as they come up throughout game development like it's it's a wild journey start to finish there's there's a sweet spot right after the concept where it's blue sky and you know you throw out as a writer you throw out every idea possible then there's a sweet spot right when the the animators and the modelers and everyone gets a hand a uh, hold of it and it's right when you don't think you're ever going to run out of time ever <laughs> <laughs> and everyone like you, everyone gets to touch it right everyone's like oh yay so exciting and that moment is as a writer at least you're seeing your words like turn into sets and and into all these assets and models and then getting getting the model for for Blair back I was like oh my god her arms I never thought arms <laughs> would be this big and and it it goes to all these other artists who have you know share that vision and then put it like make it come to life and I remember the first time I saw um Annika walk and I was like oh my god that is her walk and you, <laughs> all, all you write as a writer is Annika walks to the kitchen or Annika walks to her room but then when it when an animator gets a hold of it and once the modeling is done you're just like oh my god that is what I like that is from my brain and so it's this amazing moment where all the artists you know it's like a mind melt and everyone's on the same page and it's still early in the process. So you think you have all of this time. So you're like, Oh my God. Yes. Let's, let's spend all of this time on this one thing. Um, and that's like the sweet spot. And it's definitely my favorite part of production. Yeah. Like you're yeah. seeing your character come alive for the first yeah. time, like seeing Be- Be- Bevan's first animations of Annika, where it's like, oh God, she's a real person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and you don't think about it, but the eye blinking animations come so much later. And so yep. she's walking around, her eyes are just huge. And it's just like, <laughs> doing things so you're like <laughs> when are we gonna get the facial animation <laughs> it's scary also but always this beautiful moment like every game i've ever worked on where like everyone goes like oh my god it's a game you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> like all of these these pieces come together and you're like this is a video game um mm-hmm. and that's always like deeply satisfying too I can only imagine, you know, the kind of feeling of accomplishment that you have after 
working sometimes in silos, right? Like with your own individual team and then being able to kind of come together with all the other teams to make something. The idea of like it truly takes a village. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. people think it's a lot more collaborative the whole way through. Um, then sometimes you get the luxury of it being particularly developing in the pandemic, which is something, you know, we haven't even talked about, you know, did you uh, have those challenges with Stonefly or were, was the game mostly in the kind of final dregs of polish um, before the pandemic happened? No. <laughs> You're like, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the development, it's kind of funny. Like I started on Stonefly in March 2020. So it, it was... Unlucky. I, I, I know. It was it was unbelievable timing. But I, I worked entirely remotely, joined the team entirely remotely, and we figured out how to how to make the game. We figured out how to make game. But <laughs> it took a long time to kind of get the rhythm going. Because, like, I'm used to working in person. I'm used to collaborating, bouncing ideas off of, and, and kind of building in that sense. So... Figuring out how to do it over, like, we primarily use Discord was, like, very, very challenging. And I think that we got a good rhythm to it, but it definitely meant that, like, we had to adapt. And I had to kind of learn how to, uh, like, not, not entirely, like, do it my, like, fly on my own. Because I had the support of Bo and Adam all the time. Like, we were always available on Discord. But it, it really meant that, like, I had to I had to learn to trust myself a little bit more. I had to learn to trust my design instincts a little bit more. And ultimately, I think it pushed me in a in a better direction as a as a design. I feel like I grew, but it was really hard and it might not have been. <laughs> it might, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know what and I was so, realizing as we've been having this conversation and I've been showing some gameplay. If you guys are watching at YouTube.com slash What's Good Games is that. I never asked you to explain what the game is for people oh, who haven't played it before. And I was like watching this <laughs> gameplay and I was like, I should probably let people know what this game is. So who wants to volunteer to explain Ooh, what the, the gameplay kind of like <laughs> is about? <laughs> oh, you mean it. Okay. Uh, Alyssa's like, fine. fine. Um, <laughs> we have some <sometimes. laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, like like the the tagline suggests, uh, Stonefly is kind of an action adventure coming of age story in this miniature format. Um, it's a little bit of combat battle arena style with a lot of ex exploration elements as well. One of my favorite parts of the game is like we would constantly joke on the publishing side is it's got great vibes, um, and it, <laughs> nice. it really does. Like <laughs> the the soundtrack by uh, Nature Boy Flacco is fantastic. So good. Um, oh my gosh! It's, it's just like we would just kind of have it playing in the background a lot of the time independently on, on our side um, and just really loved it. Like, as you can see, it's an absolutely gorgeous game that really stands out uh, artistically and uh, like, honestly, like beyond the combat and the wonderful story of Annika, um, it's just a, a delight to look at and enjoy and exist in the world of Stonefly. I hope I did it justice for you guys. I thought that that was beautiful. really well done. So beautiful. That was amazing. I, I am not on the marketing side of publishing, and nor have I ever been. <laughs> you did amazing. That was perfect. You crushed it. You can wrap it, it up so, oh, so well. Yeah. It's almost like you've been asked that question once or twice, and you've done press interviews, maybe? No. No, not at all. Again, that's all marketing. I <laughs> never touched that. Impressed. <laughs> impressive i will say uh, it was funny the first time i learned about media training because i come from broadcast news i came up from entertainment news and so i never really saw like the pr and marketing side and early in my video games media career i like learned that developers got media trained and I was like, wait a minute. So you're taught to specifically dodge my questions? What is this about? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and also to not panic, I guess, when yeah. when you're asked, being asked questions. That's also. actually way more like it, right? Because I <laughs> have interviewed some really confident devs and some very nervous devs oh, yeah. um, in my time. People who clearly got thrown into an interview circuit that wasn't prepared for it or was really uncomfortable with it. And it's a really interesting idea that you could have a very specific specialty on your development team that people want to hear about, like level design, right? But you, maybe when you got into game development, you never thought, oh, someone's going to put a microphone and a camera in my face and ask me a bunch of questions about what I do. You know, do any of you kind of think that that's something that should be talked about more or does it not come up enough in your careers to really matter to any of you? Um, at least at Sledge, um, me and, you know, Alexa, who, you know, was a part of What's Good once upon a time. Yeah, a um, girl, Alexa Ray Korea. <laughs> and um, I I have done some podcasting. I've, I've guessed it on Kind of Funny, et cetera. And so what they did at Sledge is go put us together and they're like, okay, you do all of the interviews. <laughs> and so <laughs> we've done a lot of interviews in the last, you know, month. Um, and it was like, oh, you, you guys are so good at this. And you're so like, you talk so well on camera and it's so easy for you. And we're like, yeah. And we're like drained. We have like four interviews a, a week. And, and it was, it was, it was great. And obviously like me and Alexa have really great. Um, we, we talk, we're, you have, good <laughs> so, you have good rapport. Rapport. Yeah, that's I was like, that's the, the word. word. <laughs> um, yeah. And so so it worked out. But, you know, you don't think that, you know, like not every dev wants to talk and be on camera, even though, you know, you want to know about their specialty. You know, they're asking about, you know, the writing of a game and and some people are better on camera than others. And and that's a skill that I, I think we don't talk about. You know, you just assume like, oh, you you did this on the game. You're the art director, Please, like talking to a camera. And some people don't like that. And some people do like that. And so some some studios, you can tell, choose the people that are really, really eager to to talk about their craft. And, and it shows in, in the interviews. 100%. And I just am always so grateful whenever any dev is willing to share their time because I know that it's so much work kind of putting these marketing beats together and it's time taken away that could be wor spent working on the game but it's also like a crucial step as you mentioned this idea that if we don't market the game if we don't get out there to shows like PAX and kind of crunch at a show where you're on the floor for like 10 hours and then you know you get a little sleep and then you got to go back and manage your booth and do all this but if you <laughs> don't do that then it's like well are people even going to know our game exists and it's out there if we don't have like a 150 million dollar marketing budget like some of these triple a games do i can't even imagine the the stress of like what if nobody plays my game? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I can from the sense that that's exactly how I felt about what's good when we launched it. I was like, what if nobody <laughs> listens to the show? <laughs> Just on a smaller scale. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did want to bring up the fact that, as you mentioned, Annika is a woman, right? Uh, she identifies as a woman. Is that... Absolutely. Accurate. Um, yeah. And we wanted to bring this up or I wanted to bring this up because we clearly don't have enough lady or femme <laughs> characters in video games. It's getting better. And thank goodness it is. And the representation across all spectrums is getting better slowly, but surely. And I brought this up because I know that our audience appreciates the diversity in games and sometimes we find that that diversity is actually more common in the indie space. And I would love to hear from any of you about the challenges that you've maybe faced in trying to present different points of view in the development process. And if you find that it's actually getting easier, or if you still think that it's a struggle. Um, I think at least for me, the, it, it highly depends on the team. Um, being on the team I'm on now, like Linda can attest, like Bo and Adam are great to work with. Um, and they, they, they listen and they, they care about like the input from folks like Belinda and I, who are obviously not dudes or not obviously, but like <laughs> we, we are not, we do not identify as dudes at this time. So like, it's, um, it's, it's very refreshing to be on a team like that because I like, 
I'm sure I'm not the only one here that has had experiences on teams that are predominantly like older cis, cis guys that don't always uh, want to hear other opinions or they do, but they don't necessarily want to do anything with those voices or opinions. So having the space to contribute and actually like work on my craft and continue and contribute to like the design of a game that is like overall because of the experience of a character that is is a woman was like really it was really really refreshing and nice <laughs> it's it's uh like i've had both good and bad experiences this what i would like stonefly i would say is a good experience i've had bad experiences uh i'm sure that someday i will have bad experiences again just like i will have good ones again it's a slow slow process but i think it is getting better because we are making more room for more women to feel welcome and more femme like just non-cis white guys to feel comfortable and safe in the industry that we're in by just making as much space as we can by using our voices to continue to like make games that show representation and also have that representation be present during the development cycle. Cause that I feel is a really crucial bit that maybe isn't as uh, known perhaps, or like focused on of like behind the scenes, inclusivity and diversity matters just as much as the characters. Yeah. And to that, I think part of the reason why indie seems to be doing so much better with this <clears throat> is indie versus triple a is indies more willing to and like it feels like a terrible way to phrase it but like take risks in hiring practices mm. with uh like less established names people that might be newer to the industry who haven't been given a chance before um at least in my experience that's what i've seen more frequently um and a lot of those voices are going to be the ones that have been shut out from the old dudes club that have been <laughs> in this industry forever, you know? Um, and because of that, it lends itself to having more diverse voices overall, um, which is great because at least to me, what I, what I feel is the way to make these processes better and more equitable is having those voices in the room and listening to them when they say, this is what things need to look at, look like in order to be representative of different experiences. Yeah, and at at least on Stonefly, like the the team had a lot of women on it. Like, yeah. you know, as you can see here, <laughs> there's already three, which is a lot in, in, in the game industry. And <laughs> uh, and and it made me feel really comfortable. And you know, Annika is is a teenage girl, and like teenage girl emotions are very specific emotions. Very, <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> very conflicting emotions. Um, and they're really special. And so the fact that we all had a, a hand in telling Annika's story because we've all been a teenage girl and <laughs> we're just like, oh yeah, we've definitely disappointed our parents like this <laughs> and, and things like that. And um, and yeah, I, I thought it was really special and, and Bo and Adam did a really great job of making sure that like all the women are heard on the team and they took my feedback and everyone's feedback really seriously and, and made adjustments as, as needed. That's great to hear. I think that it's important to highlight when dev teams do have really great ratios like Flight School does. I know that's something that, you know, Alexa and I have talked about when she talked to me about her experience at Sledgehammer, you know, obviously I talked about it on the show. You might not have heard uh, the previous episodes, but I mentioned on the show that she and I spoke after her Dev Diary video came out and, you know, all of the fiasco was happening. I was like, is it okay? Are you okay? Are things, are things good? And she's like, I'm good. Our team's great. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> Our team is very great. Our team is half women, which also does not happen very often in the games industry, um, especially at a AAA studio and in a game like Call of Duty. So I'm really thankful that I've personally been blessed with, with teams, especially like at Flight School um, and at Sledge that uh, are primarily women even the the comms team at ubisoft was primarily women and people of color and so i've been really blessed i know everyone has not been that blessed in the industry but hopefully everyone will be that lucky and it won't be a lucky thing anymore it will just be very very normal and yes practical. that's so encouraging to hear that like that though like that's your experience that's your real very real experience so like <laughs> that more of that is yes, hopefully coming like hopefully. that's that's excellent <laughs> And it's coming, you know, in a in a big AAA way too. You yes. know, I think it's important to identify that working in establishment properties can be so much more challenging because you feel like your voice doesn't carry as much weight, right? Like you are entrenched with people 
particularly older men who have mm. been in their publishing jobs or their uh, developer jobs for decades and they're like well this is the way that it's always been and it's like but that's not the way that it should be bro <laughs> like, can we maybe change the way it's always been are you open to talking about doing something differently and I think that conversation is finally happening now which is encouraging but clearly still a long way to go um, I'm really encouraged by the programs that are designed to getting really young people into game development, you know, things like, you know, um, Girls Who Code and other programs that are designed specifically at STEM programs, trying to get young women into those fields to say, hey, like you belong in these fields. And wouldn't it be great if your voice was in this field to make an impact? Because I think, you know, what this conversation really revolves around is this idea that we as women have specific points of view that we're lacking in narratives and design of all kinds for a really long time in game dev. And thankfully that's changing slowly, but surely <laughs> doing, doing work where we can and like make space yeah. and like contribute our voices too. And like, just to quickly touch on like one of the things you had mentioned earlier of like going into becoming a game developer can like it didn't occur to me that I might be in front of a camera be asked questions or on a podcast at all because that was like I just didn't consider that at all but knowing that like see like even just like seeing making connection with somebody of like oh that's that's somebody that's that's like me and they're doing something that I've not seen any other women do or like that's that's not something I considered for myself because it didn't seem welcoming is important so like even though this is something that's like new to me and i'm i'm not as experienced as belinda or Alyssa, and it's a little nerve-wracking <laughs> it's it's important to uh to to be to, to represent yourself so that you can help like help make more space for people in the industry that that might not consider it otherwise that are yeah feel feel locked out by oh no no <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's I think it's great. I think it's great that you mentioned that. It's something that we talk about on the show and I know that it's important for people to use their platforms when they have it, but sometimes it can feel like a lot of pressure, particularly this conversation that feels ad nauseum of like, what's it like to be a woman in games? And it's like, can I just, <laughs> yeah. can we just for a second talk about what it's like to just be a person who works in game dev? Do, it, does, do we always have to color the conversation of the fact that, you know, I have a vagina? Is that like the thing? <laughs> I feel like. I, I can speak for all of us here that we're all like exhausted. Yes. <laughs> the like, oh, like you're a woman or non male presenting person. Uh, what's it like? Because you're different and novel. Like, stop. <laughs> Game Dev is like not enough to talk about on its own, you know? Yeah. Um, obviously, it's still a really important conversation and it's still necessary to happen. But like, God, I'm sure we're all excited for when it isn't. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? We're all excited for when it isn't. Um, I do want to ask another question from our community. Uh, Javin Mather says, welcome to the podcast. Uh, what is a narrative you'd specifically love to see explored in games relevant to women that hasn't been tapped into yet? Moms. I would love to see Ooh, okay. mom protagonists in games and you know, see the struggles, like, it, it doesn't have to be about being a mom, but it should have the struggles of being a mom, where we have something like God of War, which is about being a dad, or... Yeah, dad Last of war. Of Us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last of Us, which is, you know, kind of, you know, Joel being a dad figure, and I would love to see a game, like, a triple A game where it is someone being a motherly figure and you know, the mom doesn't get killed in the first like right? ten minutes of the game. <laughs> um, but I so think true. the that isn't explored enough and I think it should be explored a lot more. So are you stewing on this? Because you had that answer like locked and loaded. <laughs> oh I yeah. I are you writing so. a mom game, Belinda? I hope I wish I was writing. <laughs> I would be calling you to ask you about your experiences as a mom. You um, you let me know. I, I'm a new mom, so I don't have a lot of deep experiences as many other moms out there. But I feel like we need to get somebody with money into this idea. Let's make this mom game happen. I'm into. I'm into it. 
I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, for me, like what I what I want to see is games centering women that aren't centered on the fact that they're women. Um, I feel like that's whenever we have like a female protagonist, it's like, oh, you're a woman, you know, like we, we get a lot of that and seeing like atypical representation, like kind of like getting more moms in games. We had our sad dad year of games. Um, <laughs> like what sad moms or uh, whatever it may be. Like, I feel like there is a little bit of, of cookie cutterness in the progress that we have been seeing so far um, and exploring like, what makes a strong woman outside of just being physically strong um, and physically capable, whatever that may be. Like there are other things that make people strong and interesting. And I feel like that's a space that hasn't been explored very much yet. I think that's really interesting to hear because I think that when I hear that, I go, yes, I love that. And then I immediately go, but is there going to be pushback from audience because then now you're focusing on the gendered experience? And I think that this is a part of the conversation that we sometimes don't have a lot of like, is it okay to have that gendered experience and make the experience say, hey, I actually just want to tell this gendered story versus making it an androgynous story? And is that something that you think about when you're going into your process? And, you know, do we have space for both of those things? Definitely. I I mean, personally, I would feel, I feel that we need space for both. I think it's necessary that we make space for both because largely like the dad, sad dad games, the year of all the sad dads, <laughs> Joel and Kratos and Arthur kind of, I don't know. <laughs> there, there was all the, he's kind of a dad to the camp, but like there's, there is a lot of very heavily gendered experience in the male lens. And I feel like in order to like kind of feel like it's more even representation, I would love to see both gendered experiences for women of like mom of war i want to see like uh i want to have a, a story about an angry angry god angry like war god who's a woman and that's her experience she's not punished for being angry or having negative emo emotions or killed off for being a mom like those feel like a counter to that and in the same vein i would also like to see stories that are not necessarily focused entirely on gender of just like this is a person this is their experience based on who they are, what they look like, or what they can do. Because, like, a lot of, for me, like, video games are kind of a, a fantasy, right? Like, I like playing uh, exciting action games because I like to feel like an exciting action hero. I, I feel less uh, attached to it being a gendered experience. Is why I love Spyro so much. <laughs> I just like feeling like a purple dragon. That's awesome. So I, li I like having kind of... I, I would love to see more of both, but I think there needs to be space for both. Um, and... In either case, I think there will be pushbacks. There'll be the sal salty gamer boys that don't want to see more women represented. And goodness, no, not anybody that's mm -hmm. like neither. Like <laughs> that. Would, oh no! Goodness, like so, no. <laughs> so, yeah, that. that yeah, it I would love to see um, both. <laughs> like you know, us as women, like we still feel the feelings that Kratos feels. Like we still yeah. feel the feelings that Joel feels. It's not like yes, they are having a gendered experience, but it it all comes down to that universal feeling and human. <laughs> yeah, which is human and, and everyone can relate to that. So why not have it be a woman? And it's not saying like, because it's a woman, like men can't relate, like men can absolutely relate to women. I relate to men, like, you know, there are times where I relate to men, but you know, I think that if we, you know, do kind of make that change and like there, there are guys that, you know, really like Aloy. Right. And, mm -hmm. and think she's, incredible protagonist and it's not because she's female it's because she's you know tough and strong and these universal feelings that you know every character embodies so yeah. absolutely for me like it's I've had to like project myself onto these like white dudes my entire gaming career <laughs> like they these, the white dudes can sit back and project themselves onto a woman like <laughs> yeah so <many> times <laughs> in their life like, not use your imagination <laughs> right exactly mm -hmm. I feel like there's a large portion of men who play games that quite enjoy playing as women characters. And I know some of my 
some of my personal friends like always pick female avatars like when they play games that you where you can pick a gender um they just do it by default and i was like well i always pick female because i there's so few games that let me do it i mean there's more (laughs) now obviously but um i just always want to like make a version of myself uh, um in game maybe i'm a narcissist i don't know um but there are plenty of men out there i think that want that gendered experience as well and want to experience something that's different to what they have in their own life which is great more experiences for everybody Uh, well we're coming to the end of our conversation and I kind of wanted to just end with things that maybe you're excited about that you've seen in the development community or even a game that you're like hey this is a game that I think is doing cool stuff if you haven't heard of it and you haven't played it, maybe you should check it out. So I'll let each of you pick if you want to talk about a cool dev thing or a cool game or both. And I'm going to pick Mel. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Uh, I mean, honestly, there's there's a lot of uh, things I liked about the games that came out this year. Like, I've been so, so enjoying Subnautica Below Zero. Like, the narrative in that game is so beautifully, like, just laid out perfectly for me to find and I, I I love finding stories and completing stories that way and I think they're taking that kind of uh, approach to narrative and they're they're laying it out in such a really beautifully paced way I'm having a fantastic fantastic journey in, in that game right now and I I know it uh, is, a, is a sequel to Subnautica so and the first game had kind of a similar approach to the narrative but I, I felt like they they polished that experience really well um, and I've just been uh I, I again like a, having a, a a woman protagonist, a woman of color protagonist that is not um, like that. Like she has a lot of dynamic parts of her uh, as a character that are much more like presented up front at the start of the game, um, and they they've like rolled out a beautiful narrative for you to kind of explore and find as you swim through this frigid, terrifying ocean. And it's <laughs> it hits these emotional notes in really beautiful ways that surprised me, and I wasn't expecting it because I I loved the first game, but I I didn't. Uh, I didn't feel as connected to the narrative as I do in Below Zero, like right off the bat. So that's just, that that's the first thing that I could think of. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Belinda, we're coming to you. Um, I recently, because I'm, I'm in narrative design, so anything with like a really great narrative, um, really, oh, it's so juicy to me. And recently I played Unpacking, which is this. Ah, yes. Incredible. I've been playing this too. Indie. Yeah, that's, you know, maybe like a three, four hour experience, but the things that they do with the narrative in that game, and I was going into unpacking thinking it was a very chill game where you unpack things, which I was also okay with. Um, I thought it was going to be in the realm of, you know, like power wash simulator, like things that are just feel good to do. Um, And I was really surprised that there was, you know, a narrative that weaved its way through it and how emotional I got. To, I know, to and I don't want to, no spoilers, but there's like I this know. one moment where there's an object that you have to yes. put in a specific place. Yes. Yeah. And it like stumped me at first and then it like hit me all at once of what I had to do with it. And I was like, <laughs> Oh no! Like, part, right, and and as far as narrative design, right, like you know, there's not even a lick of dialogue, right? Like there's there's little captions here and there, but not a lick of dialogue, no voice acting, like nothing. And they really just pushed the limit on it, and I was blown away. And if any of you that are listening haven't played it, like please play it. It's it's gonna take an evening of your time. It's it's amazing. I think like when I think of narrative design and things that I want to strive for, like that is exactly what I want to see is, is people taking, taking the engines that they're, they're making the stuff in and really trying to find the most unique way to tell a narrative. And it's, Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I will not stop talking about it. And even of your time, maybe if you're very efficient at unpacking, I've, <laughs> I've been playing that game for what feels like a really long time. Maybe it's because I just am very neurotic about the way that I am placing things right. in the world. Because yeah. I just take everything out of the boxes and put it on the bed or the floor. Yes. And then I like <laughs> one at a time put things... It's it's bad. Especially the underwear and the socks because there's yes! so many. I'm just like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to put them all on the bed, which is what I, I would do in real life. Right. Yeah. And then some of them have a matching pair and then some of them don't. Yeah. yeah. It's like, what? What's happening? Like <laughs> real life. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Touche. Uh, Alyssa. Um, 
for me right now, my to be played list is uh, just a lot of catching up over the last year. Um, I definitely find myself either playing a game that I can play in a weekend or playing a game that I will lose the rest of my life to. Uh, and there's like <laughs> high stakes. <laughs> yeah, there's like no in between. So I'm hopping between like, oh, I'm going to spend a weekend in like unpacking or whatever it may be and uh, enjoying myself thoroughly there. Or I semi recently got like absolutely dragged into Final Fantasy 14 online, um, which has been like disastrous for my actual life. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm thoroughly enjoying myself uh, there. And I'm also so, like, unapologetically a big sims person which is like i have thousands of hours in sims 4 at this point which is only slightly embarrassing why would that be embarrassing i know many people that have thousands of hours into a single game it's one of those things because i'm the kind of person where i launch it up and i'm like i'm gonna build a house right now and then i just like (laughs) stare at it for like four hours you know what i mean like it's yes pretty bad so those those are kind of how I occupy my time. Um, but like upcoming, like I'm on the Starfield hype. I'm I'm excited for that. Um, or like whenever I see a game that has a robust character creator, sold. That's all it takes for me to be like, I will buy this video game. <laughs> I'm glad uh, you brought that up because I w- I'm curious what what's your opinion of like who do you think has your favorite, not necessarily the best. But your favorite character creator? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously. Um, But I'm not sure. I can't think. Just because I get so caught up in, like, opening up a game, especially when I'm, like, surprised by one. Like, going back to Valheim, like, it has the, the, like, tiniest character creator ever. Um, That's extremely basic. But when I launched it up, I was like, oh, my God. Yes. There's four hairs to choose from. (laughs) Uh, That sort of a thing. Um, I also really enjoyed the uh, character creator in Boyfriend Dungeon. Uh, just because it's pretty rare to see more than one curly hair representation. Um, and I have quite curly hair. Um, curly hair and- represent! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always pretty exciting to be like, oh, there's more than, like, one texture of hair in this game. So, like, those are the, the more concepts that get me excited in character creation. But hair is, like, one of the hardest things to animate, isn't it? It's and up there. Yeah. <laughs> I know that that's like a kind of terrible excuse to be like, this isn't why we have more hair options, but hair is hard to animate. It's like that whole like, well, we didn't have a woman because she was hard to animate <laughs> um, conversation. Um, clearly, that's, you know, gone and by and we're no longer talking about that. But um, hair is something I think that is also super important to inclusivity. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Curly hair. Let's go. Um, cool. Well, ladies, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time out of your days to chat with me on our show. Um, for everybody that is interested, um, Stonefly is out now. You can get it on Steam, GOG, Epic Game Store, Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo Switch. So basically, if you game on any device except for mobile, and who knows, maybe someday they'll port it, um, you can play Stonefly and... Ladies, I do want to let our viewing audience know if you are interested, if they can follow you on your social media channels. Are you up to stuff? Do you post on the Insta? Are you on TikTok? Are you on Twitter? Uh, Mel, where can people find you and what you're working on? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, at Mel Rambles because I ramble a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, I have a, a Twitch channel. I sometimes stream at twitch.tv slash Mel um, And I sometimes stream Stonefly, sometimes... Some Nautica, mostly Skyrim. <laughs> yes, uh, just, yeah. 10 years Skyrim. Isn't that wild? Yeah, I can't believe it. I'm so old now. <laughs> <laughs> and they're adding fishing now. Holy yes. <laughs> it's Lydia and I's 10th anniversary. We've been Aww, together so long. Adorbs. <laughs> uh, Belinda, where can people find you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at, at BBC Garcia. Um, any updates or anything that I'm working on, you're going to find there. And, you know, sometimes she tweets about what her partner is baking and sometimes she doesn't, you know, (laughs) tell him to stop posting like hunger traps. Okay. Yeah. He's unstoppable. (laughs) He's going to keep doing it. (laughs) Alyssa, where can everyone find you? Um, 
I am on Twitter at Hyperless. Um, mostly just really dumb takes on video <laughs> games and just really whatever. But yeah, I, I'm mostly a shit poster and I fully lean into that fact. That's the way to use yes, it. <laughs> yes, that's yes. what we like. We like the shit posting. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, well, thank you again for joining me on tonight's episode. And thank you everybody for listening. Uh, Britt and I will be back next week with a special Thanksgiving episode. She has got some Halo Infinite to talk about because as everyone knows, the multiplayer beta went live. Surprise! Uh, and we'll have some other news updates for you. So we will see you guys next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.